So 1990 and 91, you run okay. Uh, you got another win at Orange County, but otherwise the results were kind of up and down. How big a learning curve did you have those first two full-time seasons in the Bush Series? It was called loyalty, and you I've got to call that a year and a half okay. of up and down. Because I wanted the boys that helped me through the late model days to – go to this alliance team and then again jack ingram come to me he said robert i'm fixing to retire he said you need to get ben barnes motors you need to get ricky pearson as a crew chief and you need to hire this boy here owen and get rid of them boys you got so i ain't gonna get rid of them we need help and i come home and called ricky pearson and owen edwards that I knew personally, he said, hey, I'll come to work when Jack retires. And then went down and talked to Ben Barnes, and he said, yeah, since Jack's retiring, I'll build your motors. And when Ricky Pearson come on board, it was just like we went to the very next step. We went, you know, we run good at short tracks, but, you know, we hadn't never been to Nazareth. We hadn't been to New Hampshire. We hadn't been to some of these racetracks we was short track guys and when ricky come in here i mean it was like me wrestling race cars to me being able to drive a race car because they drove so good and that was the difference and i owe everything we got to alliance ricky owen and ben barnes so tell me about the pearson family because you got ricky you had Eddie. I don't know that yeah. Ed, did Eddie work for you. No, or, he, was uh, he was weekend with, help. Okay, come right. in, and, and then of course you had David in the mix somehow. Um, what was it like to be around that family? Ricky Pearson and me had a relationship that we both probably could say, "What if?" Like a Ray Everham, Jeff Gordon. Mm -hmm. You know who was the best? We was a team. It was times we'd call each other 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning before the race in the motel. Hey, Ricky, I just thought of something. What about if we do this? Or Ricky would say, Robert, here's what I'm going to do now. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. That was a relationship that me and him, we believed in each other. He supported me 100% and I supported him. And there was times there was controversy, but you had to have it. But David was around very little. You know, okay. but he was always at Darlington, Rockingham, and place. Well, and uh, you go back to '91, and then that's when we started turning everything around. But '92, we go to Darlington the year before I'd run 18th and 15th, two or three laps down. You know, Darlington, you better know what you're doing there. So we practice, and we're 22nd on the board out of 40-something. We're where I should have been at Darlington. In 92? 92. 92 okay. Spring race. Yeah. David comes over there, and he's sitting on the truck, and he said, Boy, Boy. You, you don't drive this racetrack. He said, Let me tell you. So it was raining, and we was getting ready to qualify. David, being David Pearson, owned Darlington, and he got uh, – Jim Hunter, and said, hey, I'm going to take this boy out around the racetrack slow in the pace car. We rode around that racetrack for about 10 minutes, and David telling me, here's what you do, here's what you do. It's slow, you know, because it was raining. I said, really? And he told me what the car was going to do. He said, you can't let off, you can't, you got to keep traction and rear tire. It stopped raining that afternoon, getting ready to qualify. Mark Martin sits on the pole, and I sit on the outside pole. Had gained like a second from practice to there. Not changing nothing wow. on the race car. And the race started, and I seen then more what he was talking about of how you don't race that racetrack. You race your car. You don't worry about nobody in there in front of you until you're ready to pounce on them. You find out their weak place because there ain't many places packed. You don't run, run run side by side with nobody. And we end up winning the race. The 
200 lap Darlington race because of a rain delay. If it had not rain delay, and then we come back next year and win the race again. Well, before we go yeah. to 93, I want to talk about 92. Not only did you win at Darlington in the spring of 92, you passed Harry Gant on the last lap. Yeah. To do it. Take me through those last few laps. Okay. Harry's kind of running like he does at Darlington. We're a third place car. Yeah. Caution comes out with 10 laps to go. We come in, get tires, and Ricky Pearson, Eddie Pearson, and my crew, we get out on pit road first. Harry's on the outside. Harry calls us the little high school kids. You know, oh, I'll let them little kids ride and then I'll take them when I want them. Well, I'm leading, leading, leading there. And all of a sudden, about three or four laps ago, Harry passes me. And we come off of turn two, the old turn two or the racetrack turn two at that time. And I pull up beside of him. And I didn't realize, because Harry had not got away from me. You know, I was right there. And I got under him. And I seen what was going on. And we got side by side, and he let me go. On the last lap? Uh, two laps okay. ago. Right. And he's sitting there behind me, and I said, what in the world's going on? And then he pulls up there and gets beside of me, and we're going down the back straightaway. And now, uh, listen, back straightaway is what, three and a half seconds long? Yeah. And David Pearson gets in my ear, not on the radio, of what he told me, Robert, best thing about Darlington is whenever you can let somebody sneak in on your inside, and then when they go up the track and you pass them back, you do the cross on them. He said, son, that's racing right there at Darlington. <laughs> and I'm thinking, whoa, Harry's going to cross me. And I heard him lift, I lifted, he lift, I lift, and I make him go in the outside with me. <laughs> <laughs> no opportunity to do the crossover. And then he realized, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. He was going to teach me a lesson, yeah. and I taught him one. The best thing about it after the race is over, and next week we're talking, I guess, at Dover or where we're at, and, or next place we race together, I think, was Dover. And he said, you didn't outsmart me. I knew you'd crash me if I'd done that. <laughs> I said, Harry, you think I would have wrecked you? He said, I wasn't going to take no chance because I had to win that cup race the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Harry had an answer for everything, but <laughs> but it's amazing, and only race car drivers, I think, can really understand. Of A wreck is slow motion, but that Darlington was slow motion going down the back straightaway, and like right when we was getting the three, Pearson, oh, here's the funnest part of the racetrack, <laughs> when you can do a yeah. crossover. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, beating Harry was no small thing, especially at that point, because he was coming off that just crazy September, the just a couple months, a few months before. Yeah. Was that the race that put you on the map, oh, so yeah. to speak? After that race in 92, in the spring of 92, uh I started getting calls to go cup racing. You know, ain't it ironic that I win a bush race at Orange County and start getting bush calls. Now I finally, I think I'd won Orange County twice and maybe somewhere else or something. And then you win Darlington. Now the cup owners are calling. Hey, what's your plans here? You know, hey, I'm getting, I love Bush Grand National. I'm not going nowhere. And then all of a sudden, Toward the end of the 92 season, I get the call from Leo, and he says, Hey, Robert, Harry Gant's going to be retired in a couple years. Would you be interested in signing the contract now to take over for him? It could be 94, or it could be 95 or 96, but we want to tie you up. And I said, Well, I don't really know. You know, I, I, so man, it was that early. Yeah, it was that early, okay, and yeah. nobody knew about this. Yeah, 
and I'd met with Skull, and I mean, it was a top, top secret deal. Kyle, the Skull Bandit car is what I was told from Johnny Hayes and Leo Jackson. Harry Gantz, the Skull Bandit. You'll never be the Skull Bandit. Rick Mass is not the Skull guy. You know, nobody. That's Harry. We never want Harry to think that we're planning ahead to make him think that we're wanting to get rid of him. Because if Harry wants to race till he's 65 years old, he's going to drive this race car. What we want is to put you in the car when he gets out. I said, well, I can do that. So I went back to my owner. And just filling him out one day, and I said, hey. you talking about? Uh, Alliance. Okay, yeah. And I said, hey, what's our goals? You know, you know, we talked a couple years ago about going cup racing. Robert, we love what we're doing right now, and we're going to be here, you know, with everything going on, and this is where the government, because the government was kind of funding the Alliance deal, you know, because that was during the time when people was losing their jobs and, they was paying people to learn a trade. So it was both ways. And he said, hey, we're good. Are you wanting to leave? And I said, oh, no, no. I want to make sure we're good for the next couple of years. Because I knew Harry was nowhere near ready to retire. And, uh, oh, yeah, but, Robert, anything ever come up, you let us know. You know, I'm not going to hold you back. Because we might go cup racing one day, and we want you. So I raced rest of, or well, it's actually in the fall of 92. I raced all 93. We're having a great year. I mean, we ain't winning as many races, but we're championship bound. You know, that's our whole goal. And we get to five races to go in 93. And what happens? The secretary of Skoll and the Secretary of Alliance go to church together. <laughs> and they go and start talking. Boy, we're so glad because they had to be, the, uh, the Secretary at school had to be there yeah. to sign the contract and get all of it notarized. Robert's coming over, and we're so happy he's going to take over for Harry when he quits a couple years from now. Next day... That was church Sunday. <laughs> on Monday, owner called me in. We was doing an appearance. And he said, I need to talk to you. I said, well, I'll be back Wednesday. Well, you need to be here Wednesday morning. And he hadn't never had that tone of voice. But we was all tensed up because five races go, we're headed to Martinsville, and we're contenders to win this championship. And my tracks are coming up, Rockingham, Martinsville, yeah. and places. I go walking in out there Wednesday morning, and I go to shop, go through, see the guys, and the shop's locked. So I go over there and I get in the office, and the owner says, uh, uh, what's your plans? I said, well, I'm going to leave tomorrow, go to Martinsville. And I said, uh, that's it, I ain't got nothing else. He said, no, no, your future plans. I said, well, I guess we're good to race next year. And we're going to go, so that would have been 94 season. So, you want to race here? You you like it here? I said, oh, I love it here. And, you know, you said that we're going to be up here. and We don't know what 95 holds. Cause I really thought Harry was going to go to 96. Yeah. And he said, well, heard you're going to go drive the Harry Gett car. And I couldn't lie to him. And I said, well, there's rumors that Harry's going to retire, and whenever he does, that I might take over. But I'm here. They know that I'm going to be here next year and everything. Had they had you signed anything? Yeah, I'd with, signed the contract. I was paid by. I was being paid by them too, not to drive anything but my lights car. And I said, "Yeah, when Harry retires, but that's a couple years down the road." He looked at me and he said, you're fired. Wow. We're getting ready to go to Mark. That's why the shop was yeah. locked up. Yeah. They was getting the seat ready for Dennis Setzer. Wow. So I come home, tell my wife, I just got fired. What? 
told her what happened. Who told? I said, well, the secretary's got to talking and found out. And now other people was finding out, you know, because Ricky Pearson knew and everything. And so I get on the phone and I called Johnny Hayes. And I said, Johnny, I just got fired. What? <laughs> yeah. I said, I just got fired. I said, they found out two secretaries got to talking, found out I'm going to drive for his coal car, and he told me if I wasn't happy here that I'm fired. And Dennis Setcher's going to drive the car at Martinsville. I'm in the point championship, and we've worked hard to do this. I'll call you back. <laughs> Hung up. Fifteen minutes later, he calls on the phone. You're driving Rick Mass' coal car <laughs> up at Martinsville. <laughs> wow. I said, me and Rick ain't getting along because we'd had confrontation yeah. earlier in the year at Martinsville. We both started on the front row, and we got together. <laughs> and Rick and me was not on talking terms. And so I called Rick, and I said, Rick, it's Robert. I said, <laughs> he said, yeah, Skull told me <laughs> that you're going to drive my car. <laughs> and I told him, like hell. <laughs> Me and Rick become best friends that weekend. Went to Martinsville. We was running good. And I finished the year out in the Skull car, uh, the Rick Mass car. They run the other race. Well, we had something happen one of the races. We couldn't do something. And Andy died fourth or fifth in the points, I think, that year or something. And next year, I have nothing. And I get a call from Larry Hedrick. Get a call from Rick Hendricks. And Harry Gant announces he's going to retire. 94 is his farewell. And I think we kind of sped that up of them two secretaries talking. Because, Harry, I'm ready to retire anyway. You know, heck, I'm glad you know yeah, yeah. all that. So I get a deal from Larry Hedrick. Rick Hendricks, a guy, Jimmy Johnson, not the racing Jimmy yeah. Johnson, the other one. Yeah, I'd be interested in driving. And I went to Leah and told him, and he said, yeah, one year. Because, <laughs> man, we want you to practice in Hendricks cars or Hendricks cars <laughs> before you get in here because this cup deal is going to be different. You're going to tear stuff up. So... Me and Jimmy Johnson talked on the phone. Yeah, I'd like to do a one-year deal, and then we can do options or whatever, you know. I couldn't tell because Harry Gant had not been released yet. They wanted to make a big press release in January on that. And they said, okay. Well, then I get a call back from Rick Hendricks, uh, Jimmy Johnson. Robert, uh, we're going with Terry Labonte. So you were going to drive the five car. Yeah, going to drive the five car. And said, uh, Really? We didn't know when we went back and told them that it was between Robert Presley, Terry Labonte, and somebody else to drive a car and everything. They said, well, why do you want Robert Presley for one year? Because he's already signed a contract called Chevrolet Harry, Chevrolet Henry. And they said, you didn't tell us that you already had a contract for 95. I said, well, y'all didn't ask. I said, <laughs> I said I would do it for one year with options. <laughs> so wow. that blowed that out. And then Waddell Wilson was at Hedrick. And Chevrolet had already told all their people because they're looking for drivers in their car. And Hedrick said, well, I think I got Robert on the hook. Him and Waddell's met several times. Then I get a call from Waddell and says, well, we're not looking for a one-year driver. So that's when now everything's run out. And the 99 car calls and says, hey, Ricky Craven's left. He's starting his own team. We was just going to run idle, but will you drive for us? Got to Daytona, and they put me on Hoosier tires in the 99 car. And 94 is a year of the worst yeah. of my career, but the brightest part of knowing I was going cup the next year. Hindsight being 2020, 
you're you're talking to Hendrick Motorsports, and it, uh, Hendrick Motorsports at that time wasn't the Hendrick Motorsports that it eventually became. But Jeff was making a lot of steam and making it good there in '94. Was there has there ever been a point? where you thought to yourself, you know, maybe I could have taken Hendrick and told Leo that I'm going to go with Hendrick. But we back up to 1977, 78, and 79. My daddy's driving for Leo Jackson in gotcha. late model sportsman and winning races from Canada to Georgia. And Leo was like family to us. Okay. And – yeah. And to be able to drive the Skull Bandit, because, yeah. you know, a year and a half earlier, they're Mr. September, you know. Yeah. And it's at my hometown, and I don't have to sell nothing. I don't have to move or anything. And this question's been asked me on every interview I've done since 2006 when I quit racing. Do you wish you would have went with Petty Roush the Hendrix deal, why you pass that up, makes no sense at all to a lot of the people that's interviewed me. Larry Hendrick, you had opera. Robert, you was one of the three top drivers, and you picked the Skull car. Yeah, I picked it two years earlier. I'm loyal, and I was not going to break that contract with Leo. They was no – and Skull – and go back to call Rick Mass and say, Robert's driving your car. <laughs> you know, there's no loyalty in racing, really. Yeah. But I felt good about it. And it even goes up to the years when I left school, when Andy Petrie bought it, and me and Andy had been rivals the whole time of my late model. And I knew when Leo said, you know, he was going to get out of it because his father had passed away. And Leo had lost interest, you know. Harry Gant was the greatest that they was. I mean, he was – Harry Gant's a better race car driver than anybody's ever give him credit for, except his fans. He's good. And after that right there, I decided, you know what? I'm going back Bush Grand National Racing. And got up with Tad Geschefter, and he was having some trouble, and – Went and drove for him in the 97 season. And halfway through the season, I missed cup racing to an extent, but not really. And Jasper called me and wanted to know if I'd drive a 77 car. We missed 14 of the last 16 races. We got Morgan Shepard driving, and he's getting old. And I said, Morgan ain't your problem. Your cars are your problem. Because, see, I didn't want to go racing. I was being asked to go, and I was not going to go somewhere unless we was going to race, you know. We wasn't going to run this stuff you got. We go to Richmond, and I'm double dipping there, Bush car, and I uh, drive 77, we make the race. We made every race my six, seven years, eight years, whatever I was with Jasper, and only missed one, we well, missed two. One was rain out and didn't have points, and the other one missed. And I felt like then I had done something. I had improved. I, you know, alliance is alliance, skull was skull. They was already established with 77 Jasper was. But me and them other two owners, Mark, Doug, and Mark, we've become a family. Roush had asked me to come over and drive one of the cars and I said, hey, I'm happy because we're making headway. And loyalty set back in again that, hey, Jasper believed in me. Jack Roush or Petty or none of them called me when I was back in that bush car. But they did and said, will you help us? And I wanted to finish my career out with Jasper. And I actually did finish my cup career with Jasper. And the way it ended up, was we had a crew chief there that thought that they had a win in race team. We'd run second at uh, Chicago. We'd run third at Texas. We had run first race at Kansas. We run fifth, you know. It was like all the racetracks we went to our first time, we was top ten cars. Yeah. And, I mean, that's over a couple-year period. 
because we don't have that many. But I felt so good inside that we took a car that was missing half the races a year and able to run with the best teams out there, and they was family. They was actually family. And when they said that, my owner told crew chief, said, if you can't get along with Robert, both of y'all are leaving. But Robert will be driving this car because he helped us get where we are to the day he tells us he don't want to drive. And in 2001, I guess it was, or 2002, rumors going around that me and the crew chief ain't getting along. And Bobby Hamilton comes up and says, hey, Robert, how would you like to come drive my Dodge truck? He said, we got the best stuff they are. And I thought about it for four or five months. I said, you know what? My kids are getting older. It'd be a good way to back down. I don't need the money. I said, hey, Bobby, what, what do I need to do? He said, just tell me you'll drive, and here's the money I'll pay you. And I said, God, yeah, I'll do that. I went to Jasper and I said, you know what? I may be holding y'all back. And me and the owner and crew chief sat down and I said, I'm gonna leave at the end of the year because you've got drivers that you're wanting and we're gonna see how good this team is because I've got a great opportunity too. Well, we made some goals that we wanted. The next year, Blaney drove the car that that's who the crew chief was wanting. And they did not even match the standards we had the year before. And my owners decided it was time for them to get out, you know, that they was not going to go back to the days of having different drivers in their car trying to make races. They, it got expensive. It was great for everybody to see and how it made me feel is going out my very first truck race and winning Daytona in the first race I've ever run you know and I felt there I am I can still drive you know and I don't regret ever anything of going Roush, Petty, Hendricks or nothing what would have happened if I'd have went to Hendricks who could you know I'm not looking out my rearview mirror. I'm always looking out the windshield, you know. And I love what I've done. I accomplished more than I ever thought I would as a kid. I got a great family. I got to see my kids grow up. I got to enjoy being around great, great. I never drove for a bad owner. Even getting fired from Alliance, that man was family to me right there.